that's, yeah, that's pretty hardcore. Um, okay, that's me, yeah. Um, I uh, do security engineering for a consulting form, uh, firm here in Raleigh. Um, my personal research or wireless realm of technology, uh, Bluetooth most of the time, and um, portable stuff. I, I used to say mobile, but that's like mobile obviously means phone now, because nothing else can be mobile. So I have to say portable, um, which is a lot of what we were talking about today. Uh, my website where I post most of my stuff whenever I get around to posting. Um, preamble, don't be a kitty. You know, you learn, uh, for the people that haven't kind of cons before and stuff, you learn a lot of stuff here you can do bad things with. So I don't need to say more, that's just short preamble. Okay, so the focus of this talk, um, basically, leave your computer at home. I, I realized this week that in labeling it hack from a library, it could, people might think, oh, software library. Like, that's what, that's not the focus of this at all. This is, this is actually from like, well, let's say like, from a computer that's not yours. So that's, that's the talk. It's not actually for libraries. Anybody, there's no coding involved, so just to clarify. Um, so what can you do um, without your system that you've got? You know, you're pre-configured. I've got my desktop or laptop. It's a Haas. Everything's set up, ready to go. Well, what if that's taken away? You know, you have to go in or, well, here's some of the scenarios that I just came off the top of my head. You know, you're doing a pen test or whatever, and um, you have to go in, and maybe you're doing some social engineering where it would be awkward to like, have a laptop in. You're going up for an interview for you know, some sales job, and you're carrying a laptop, and that just seems odd. So you know, some other way you would want to do that. Um, a real world, you know, it's a scenario where they want to say somebody comes in off the street out of nowhere, and you know, it's whatever. Um, incident response. Sometimes you have to get to where quick, you know, if you're out to dinner, but you have to respond immediately, and it's not, you know, at your office, you have to go off-site. What do you have on you that you can do incident response with? Um, backup plan, if you're all set to do your assessment and your hard drive just craps out, wh what are you going to do? You know, if you don't want to, you know, a lot of these are very ti timed engagements. Your time is precious. So if you just flew out somewhere or drove somewhere or whatever and you don't have the backup plan, you're screwed and the customers are, are ticked off. Um, it, you know, people sometimes, you know, call you out on your skills. So, you know, it might be late at night. Um, you know, people are like, oh, you're a hacker, whatever you can't do. And so, you know, you got to free yourself. On their system that they gave you permission, not like, hey, you should go attack Sony, aha, uh -huh. that might be effective, but you know, you could possibly get in trouble with that. Um, and because you can, uh, that's that's why I put this stuff together mostly, it's, you know, because you could. That's I think that's how most of these things end up coming out. It's like, oh, whatever, I can do it, so I do. Um, so it's not your computer. So this is a, a computer that's that what? Framing someone, yes, you can frame someone with this. Uh, yep. And the and the backup. The backup. Well, I I won, you know, the contest. Or I got second in the contest early. It's you know from carrying around multiple cell phones. Uh, all right. Um, we're not going to mention that contest because yeah. It's, Recorded. All right, so this is an unfamiliar system. Um, where basically, you know, a, a lot of assessments you might do, you're in map scan and become familiar before you start really delving into stuff. We'll just assume for the context of, of this presentation, it's mostly unfamiliar. I mean, probably when you walk up to a system, when you see it, you can say that's going to run Windows, that's running OS X, it's a server, it might be running a, a Unix variant. But, you know, you're coming in just that, with that brief um, knowledge, you're not, there's not a lot of prep. Uh, the access to these systems, it's not for the purpose of stealing them to sell them on eBay or Craigslist or whatever. That's not our goal here. It's to utilize them or gather information from them. So we're getting access, access to these systems. We're, that's not our intention. It's to use them. Um, hopefully, in theory, possibly, you would, not be, you would not have administrative privileges to these systems, in theory. Um, and that's kind of what we'll be working with today. These are systems that uh, you're not, you know, you're not going after specifically the sysadmins box somewhere. You, you know, we're using other stuff um, in a public or private um, domain. So that's kind of our pretext to um, what we're talking about. Public computers. Um, restrictions, a physical restriction, there's not much because they're public. They're supposed to be used by either the general public or a subset of, you know, maybe you're a member of somewhere or, um, you're, you know, somewhere for a little while, I don't know. There's like, um, 
and you're given public access to it. There's very little restrictions. Virtual, again, hopefully you're not the system administrator on these systems, but that never happens. Uh, so that hopefully they, they've locked it down a little more. Um, that's what you would assume. That's not always the case. The death of the desktop has made that a little more difficult to just find computers you know, out, out in the world. Uh, how many people here have slash use their desktop at home? And we're in the, like, this is, this is the epitome of the crowd that would be doing that. Like, not many people, everybody's got laptops now. You know, everybody's got laptops. I know people that just use their smartphone. Like, they don't own a computer. Or, yeah, tablets. I mean, the people don't even have, like, what we consider, a, you know, we refer to a computer, a laptop, net top, whatever. They're just using their mobile phone slash larger version of the mobile phone as their system. They've got it around. You know, everybody's got it. They're very cheap now. So, you know, whereas 10 years ago, you know, everybody had desktops because laptops were so expensive or they were still working off their old ha hardware. Everybody has mobile devices now. So the places that normally provide desktops, it's, it's rarer and rarer to see them. However, you, they're still around um, here. Uh, libraries, you know, a lot, almost all public libraries have uh, public computers. Again, that's a, a membership thing. Normally you have to sign up. Sometimes you have to sign up. Sometimes you don't to use those systems. Um, college campuses, it's the same exact scenario as a library. They try to provide uh, public computers, and sometimes you need to have a student credentials and not. Um, cyber cafes, I've, I've not found one here. I moved here recently. Uh, I Googled it, and apparently there's one, at least one in Raleigh. Has anybody actually ever been to one in this area? They, they closed down. I'm pretty sure that's the. What's the one near? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's like, what is their target demographic now? Uh, free at the library, and everybody else has one, so it's not, uh, not very common now. Um, <coughs> hotels have them. Uh, computer stores, um, certain computer stores that might be across the street from this location that love to have people come in and just check their email, log into Facebook, do anything they want, and you know, there's no restrictions on their use. Um, yeah, uh, and um, uh, camera shops. And this was kind of a segue into, I haven't done much research in this realm, but you know, like if, if you're doing, using a kiosk, it's a publicly available computer that you, you might not normally think of it as that, but it, I mean, it is, it's a back end, you know, stuff, you know, printers, there's other things like that that are, that are um, kind of different functions. You don't have a keyboard and mouse and you're not, you know, it's very restricted functionality, but you, you know, it's still, it's probably running Windows XP in the back end and you have some sort of interface. I mean, a lot of these um, camera shops, you've got you know, your media readers, you've got a USB one. Um, you, some of them do have keyboards and mice and stuff like that. So think of that food kiosk. There's a lot of computers out there that you can access. Now, there's other ones that, you know, like, um, like the menu at a Burger King is probably running XP in the background, but you don't really have access to it. It's there, but you know, you, that would be an interesting like, assessment, like trying to mess with that. But that's not what we're talking about today. Um, all right, uh, public computers. Yeah, so here's some that I've come across recently that I just snapped a shot of. Um, don't just use these. That's not what I'm suggesting here. These are just examples. If you had permission that, you know, you could screw with stuff. Um, yeah. Private computers. We're talking personal computers, business systems here. Um, physical access, uh, access obviously, uh, more restrictive. You probably have them, you know, in the building. Um, uh, behind locked doors, possibly. Somebody's watching out for them, using them, whatever. Uh, virtual access, they, they <laughs> was being discussed in the last talk. I mean, you, you start out with good intentions of we're gonna lock this down. Oh, you need to take off semantic for a while. Well, you know, I'll uninstall it now because that's what I'm getting in my ear, but you know, when do I reinstall it? You know, I'll get around to it. So you would assume they'd be restricted at some, but not necessarily at a very, you know, you can only run this application kind of level. It, it varies a lot. Where do you find these offices? Campus, I mean, if, if you know, th these are student computers, if, you know, that's the kind of thing you might have in scope, not like normally, but you know, just stuff to think about. People's homes, a lot of people work from home, so if you can find that in scope for an assessment somehow. Um, you know, people bring in their, their laptops to a cafe, they go to the bathroom for a while, you, you can, you know, you got a five minute window. Um, libraries, again, same thing, study, people go to their study, um, cons, People leave the laptops lying around. Or connecting to the Wi-Fi. Or connecting to the Wi-Fi, yeah. 
um, private computers. So this one in the middle I grabbed off the Hex Charity website. That's what they're running with. That's, that's, their, that's their Uber systems there. If you can't see, uh, it's uh, well, the, the boat anchor um, IMAX. Uh, yeah. So these are just, this was, I just took this like 10 minutes ago, the picture of me at the restaurant. Um, not, I didn't really, you know, I took the picture so I didn't, you know, bail on it. But how, you see that kind of stuff, you know, fairly often. I mean, some people are pretty cautious, but you never know. You see that stuff lying around. Okay, so moving on, those are the computer side. That's kind of our target um, systems there. So, uh, Katana. I, yeah, I, I put this together so it made putting the talk together a lot easier. Um, what is it? So it's a platform, it's probably the best word for it. It's basically a, a, a consolidation of a lot of tools that other people who are really smart put together and I just bundled them, essentially. There's two parts to it. One of them is the Katana um, Toolkit Live, which is a bunch of portable applications that run in Windows Live. And the other one is um, the live distributions, you know, like Backtrack, and we'll cover more of those. Um, but that's kind of the two major components. Part of the focus of this um, project was uh, to uh, create an environment that was configurable. So if you're doing lots of forensics, you know, you can configure it to do a lot of forensic stuff and maybe throw the other stuff by the wayside or the opposite. Or, you know, if you're getting into the security field, this is good because you, you've got it all kind of sitting there and you can mess, tinker with different things. So you can either broad scope it, um, update it, install it. Uh, I basically wanted something that I didn't have to carry around a case of CDs. And we all have those cases of CDs, probably still some floppy drives, you know, or, or floppy disks that, you know, we use for stuff used. Does anybody still use the floppy disks for things on a semi-regular basis? There's hands and heads not me, yeah. So that's still around. Does anybody know, not know what a floppy disk is? <laughs> it's a disk, it's about that, yeah. Are they still, <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, they, I know. I, yeah, I have. Yeah, I have some tenants. Um, floppy disks. Yeah, that's um, that's how nerdy I am. Uh, so yeah, the, but I also wanted an updatable environment because a lot of these live systems, you know, you find it's it's they're awesome, but it, it's if they're running live, you can't really modify stuff. So that's a little spiel about that. Um, to make it easier, it runs off a USB flash drive. So that was you know something you can keep on you all the time instead of a big. Honking like we had something. I, I was at Virginia Tech um, as a student there, and I worked in the IT security office. And we had the tomb of software. And you know, it's that like 500 CD binder that's like this big. You have every. You're basically a repository for certain distros at that point because you burn every new version. You're like, well, maybe I'll need CentOS 4 at some point, so I'll keep it in there. Um, so yeah, that's to avoid that. We consolidate on one medium. No crazy partitioning stuff. I'm, I'm a big fan of trying to keep you know, as much resources as you can. So anybody who's ever dual booted, normally you partition off stuff, and that was the big focus of the project, so that makes it easier. That's a little background on the tool that uh, we're going to be working with today. Hardware. I suggest an 8 gig, just, you know, for starters. Um, it's, it's about 5 gig on an unpack, but if you're going to be doing stuff, modifying or downloading files or whatever, 8 gig's good for a bottom line. They're like $15. They cost nothing now. Uh, you can get a flash drive, or, and this is what I've been working with more recently, which is really cool. It's a micro SD card, getting a USB reader, and then an SD plus a USB reader. And I'm going to go why that's really cool um, later on in the talk. I like to have a data drive as well for these kind of systems. Um, it's good to like be able to segregate. What? A date drive. I, so, you know, I, it's, oh, where's, no, I didn't. Yeah, so it's a fail. I can't find my. It's only water, so it's it's. But you got the yell drink, so I feel like you know that's that's more of anything. Um, if you can't read, I found this the other day. I've had this thing since I was like, 14 years old. I don't know where I got it or like why. I was like, I was awesome. Like I yeah. That only here does that. Yeah. So you have a date drive. Because you're lonely. Um, anyway, I'd like to put a data drive so you can put all your stuff that all the things that you're finding, whatever external stuff, just put it on there. There's a there's a um, folder in Katana. I try to structure it with documents folder. But if you're working on assessment, it's sometimes nice to you know you've got your environment here. You know, put their stuff over and something else. So flash drive, portable hard drive, whatever. Oh, oh. Um, so this is the setup that I've been working with now. Uh, 
it, it, it looks like a lot of moving parts, they almost all like fit in together. You've got a, um, where's the laser pointer? Vic, who, who had the laser pointer? Vic, he's not listening to me. Woo! Okay, it's not that important. Do you have the laser pointer? He's still not listening. I'm making eye contact. <laughs> okay, we'll just move on. I'll pretend. <laughs> I just want to do a pretend laser pointer. I know, I'm not going to. So I'll be giving it away as a prize later on. <laughs> the, the prize is for who can run the fastest. <laughs> this thing is slick. It look, it's, well, rechargeable batteries, very good. He reassembles it every time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So, um, oh, okay, say micro SD card. This is a little reader for the micro SD card. It's, it's, it's plugged in up here and it's part of the demo, so I'm not going to plug it. But it's, you know, you can see that's a st standard size flash drive. And it, it's very, very small. It's, it's convenient, except for it's so small that I have things that I have to hook it onto something because it, it's literally like the size of a thumbnail. So it's, it's very easy to lose. I haven't lost it yet, but it's inevitable. Um, this is the SD card. This is a reader. You can't really see. There's the slot right there for the reader and then the backup drive. Um, they all kind of fit together, and it's pretty neat. So I'll, yeah, I'll be talking about that a lot more a little later on. Um, live booting. This is, you know, I, I, a lot of people here are very advanced, a lot of people aren't, so this is a lot of step-by-step -step stuff. So, you know, that's just how things go. Booting from a USB, uh, if you've never done it before, you know, plug in the flash drive with the system off. Um, select from the boot menu, normally it's a function key and drop down. Um, otherwise, you can modify the boot. Um, yeah, there's just the little, my, the BIOS on my laptop. Selecting it, you want to, basically, mo most systems don't have USB storage first by default in the BIOS. It's very rare. Mostly it's like CD, hard disk, probably USB. They, you know, some of them still have like a diskette drive in case you ever hook it up there. Um, and those, that kind of varies, especially with how the age of the system. This could be first or second or not on there at all. Um, and then maybe an onboard NIC. But you need to modify that so the, the USB is above whatever else might be booting from most of the time, the hard disk. Um, so there's an issue with booting from it if somebody sets the BIOS password. So going from the security side, it's pretty good to set your BIOS password. It's not like the end all be all, but it, you know, it's one of those check boxes you should probably. Yeah, no, but I've come across it. Well, I've done it for, yeah, for you. Actually, that's a good point. How many people have done it on their system or for? Work, clients, whatever. That's a fair number here. That's, I mean, that's really good because what does it hurt? Other than if you lose it, you know, you have to document because you kind of, is it, yeah. Yeah, I thought I was going to be real smart and put a live password on the PC and then take the battery out. There's no, there's no CMOS, there's no battery, like internal, oh, okay. That's exactly what, yeah, what we're going to talk about here. So, uh, yeah, I was saying, the gentleman was saying that the, the AAA computers, um, uh, or maybe it, is it all models, some of them, like it, the, the BIOS requires power to store stuff. So if there's no little backup battery, which is what most uh, motherboards have, and you just pull the battery out of where it drains completely, it, you know, it resets to any defaults. So that's actually what we're talking about. Um, so, yeah, BIOS password, you can set it to access the BIOS. You can also sometimes set it to boot. So you have to type in your, that's what I used to have, uh, you boot um, for your disk, you know, just to boot you have to do that and then you can possibly access the BIOS. So kind of two different levels there, but we're just focused on booting. So if you can, if you can get to it from um, the boot menu, you know, we don't need to bother with any of this. So as Vic mentioned, uh, resetting them, um, well, actually, this is the, it's reset the BIOS in a desktop and possibly a laptop if you have a lot of time and you feel like unscrewing a case, uh, you can remove the battery for a while um, once it starts having power, it'll default off. There's normally a reset pins on the motherboard. It's a, you hit a jumper on there, reboot, and it'll reset the settings. Yeah, if you yeah, this is yeah, they don't they don't generally like that. What are you doing? Ah, mm, you just I'm, I'm just opening up and accessing the hard drive and stuff. It's cool, guys. Or or you know, I'm IT support. I mean, social engineering. Hello. Not nah, oh okay. Uh, I was sent over from the other branch. Whatever. They, you know. That's another, that's another topic. Not going to go too much into social engineering. We'll just put like a, you social engineered and did this. 
Um, so yeah, there's actually there's a, the, the backdoor um, BIOS passwords, which you know some genius was like. Okay, yeah, there's a lot of them have uh, the backdoor ones, and it's basically I'm sure the thought process was. When these idiots set lock themselves out, they're going to call the IT support, and the guy's going to have to, you know, tell them to open up the case and find the jumpers or find the pins for the reason. Yeah, that's going to happen. So, like, all right, whatever, we'll just put a backdoor in there, and we'll just say, oh, use this word instead. And uh, so that was a really good plan. And a lot of them are available. I think it's mostly for older motherboards because people kind of figured out, oh, that's dumb. Uh, and there's also password crackers for BIOSes. Some of them are executable. Some of them are live. CDs, because a lot of times the default is to be able to boot live CDs first, so you don't have to do a lot of this stuff for live CD. Um, another really cool thing is, uh, uh, is this uh, Plop Boot Manager, and I'll, I'll show a little bit of it later on. It's a live CD that acts as a boot manager, so it'll allow you to boot from USB. It's, it's, it's like, you know, to tell people about it, it sounds like, who cares? But to me, it's like really exciting, because now I don't have to screw with all this BIOS stuff, because Almost always, always you can boot from, unless somebody really did a good job and said, uh, this is a public computer, maybe I should never have to boot from CD unless I know the BIOS password, I'll change it so it's hard disk first, or there's ways you, know, you can unplug the hard disk. But you know, that's a pretty good setting. That's a good setting to have in a public computer. But how many people do that? That's, you know, I installed Semantic, I'm out. You know, it's, or maybe I set some access restrictions, but the BIOS is you know, pretty low on the list of things in your timeline. So anyway, uh, if it boots the, from, the, from the CD drive, uh, Plop Boot Manager is a really cool um, alternative to messing with all that stuff, and it's you know, almost guaranteed to work. So this is the live stuff. This is all the default tools I have in there. Um, what I tried to do with this project is uh, have a, a wide variety of, of, and not a lot of overlap. So there are a lot of really great tools out there that I use and fully support, and they're awesome. But I didn't put them on here by default because it's already like four gig in size, and people like using FAT32 as a file system, especially on flash drives. So you know, going over, if anybody doesn't know, FAT32 max of four gig. So once I go over that size for the download, I'm just the forms are just going to explode. Oh, I can't download this. Blah 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 blah. So I'm trying to stick under four, but everything is getting so big. Like Backtrack, like doubled in size last time. Which is awesome because you get a lot more tools out there. It's just more difficult for me because I'm trying to shuffle stuff around. So anyway, that's um, yeah, that that's what was on there. Uh, I'll show you a little more in a second. Um, so live demo number one. We drive. Ah, oh, fail. Yeah. <laughs> so nobody calls drink anymore because they're like, I was just drinking water. It's not, it's not worth it. Oh, then I won't be able to talk. My voice is going. Oh, all right. Wow, that is really hard. I apologize. I don't know how to change it, but it's really hard to see. Um, well, it's just tiny. Can anybody? I can't. I don't know if even up front you can read. So I'm just going to say what it. Is. Uh, so this is the Plot Boot Manager. It's a real shame because it's got this really cool background. It's, it's flying through stars. Like when you look at it, it's flying through stars. I can barely see it here. There's little white lights and stuff. So it's we put this together, and it's tiny. It's like less than a meg. All of this. It's I was very impressed with it. Um, oh, oh! I just know the camera's gonna shut off or something. I'm not messing with stuff. I don't need to be called out again. Anyway, it's not, it's not terribly important. You can do it. <laughs> yeah, you, you can. Yeah. Oh, yeah, let's do it. this room is just haunted now. <laughs> okay, well that's slightly better. Um, it's a. It looks better. I mean, can anybody in like the very front row kind of see that there's like little stars? For, okay, well, so you can trust them as well as me. Oh, uh, anyway, what it. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, like the back doors just slam shut, and you know, <laughs> ghosts come flying out everywhere. We are doomed. Uh, <laughs> okay, so this is this is the Plop Boot Manager or um, uh, Boot Menu. It, it it's really cool. It detects what's on the current system. So like, if there's multiple hard drives, it auto detects everything, and it's got the drivers for the USB or 
Yeah, so it, it's able to detect USB, you just you know, select it, yeah. Okay, so if somebody has not been thorough about their security mm -hmm. and set it so that their machine will automatically uh, do a CD-ROM as first and new priority, yeah. the machine will go, it will read from the CD-ROM and execute what's on the CD-ROM yes. without first uh, giving you the uh, BIOS request. So the, the, the question was about the, um, the BIOS request, like I had talked about earlier with the, the issues with bypassing the BIOS. So there's, there's the two things of, one, you can set a, any sort of, like the, like the first thing that happens when it gets power is it blocks everything and says, I'm, I've, I loaded the BIOS, the first thing I do is set a password, so you can't do anything with this system at that same, like that motherboard is nothing until you reset it. So in that case, you know, you're screwed because you can't do anything with it, which is very uncommon, especially, you know, in a, in a, because every time if, if some user unplugged it, they'd have to call tech support and get a BIOS password. So that's like not going to happen in this kind of scenario. Maybe at home it would be cool, but in this kind of scenario, it's not happening. But, uh, the, and then there's the one to access the BIOS. So it's just, if you want to modify stuff in the BIOS, you have to type in a password. Um, so in that case, this is fine because as, as long as they have, um, the CD, DVD, whatever, booting first, you'll get into this. So the first thing it selects is the hard drive, then it gives you uh, the floppy drive, a CD-ROM, and, and USB. So we're gonna, yes, okay. I, the problem, VMware has been a little flaky with, with the USB stuff, and I've been having a r lot of trouble with it, so I'm, I'm glad that went through. Um, I can block. All right, so this is the boot menu. For people that haven't been messing with this stuff before, I'll just very brief talk about it. this is backtrack. A lot of people are familiar with it. Really, you know, great suite for doing pen testing stuff. A lot of the people that here are new, like that's you know something really good. If you're gonna do try to do offensive testing and stuff, it, it's great. Um, Ultimate Boot CD is just great for anybody who's ever touched a computer. It has all those floppy images that you know the companies would send out. They they consolidated them, and yes, you can boot them from your CD. We'll just call that Voodoo. Uh, but they put all these really useful tools together. There's, you know, st dozens of really cool tools that'll test your hardware. So a lot of these aren't necessarily security stuff, but you can use a lot of it. Um, there's, there's a really cool tool in there for resetting the passwords in Windows systems. So if that's like, that makes it worth it all together. Um, and uh, so, okay, that's enough on that one. It's really great stuff. If you're doing any sort of admin, you need to have Ultimate CD for Windows, or Ultimate CD. Ultimate CD for Windows is, um, uh, basically, a limited Windows environment. Uh, it's called PE, Windows PE. It's the thing that loads Windows. Yeah, so you, you have to install it in addition to this. I can't give my default licensing stuff, but it basically gives you a portable Windows environment with a bunch of awesome stuff it pre installed on it. Um, Trinity is a lot of cool tools, similar. I mean, it, it's the same vein as Ultimate Boot CD. Ofcrack, Ofcrack fans out here. It's good, password cracking. It's not you know, as quick as the, the talk yesterday, but it's great with um, if you have an under 14 character password in Windows. Yeah? If I install UBCD for Windows, how much extra space? Oh, that's a good question. Um, he was asking how much more space the Ultimate Boot CD for Windows takes. I, wanna, I actually have no idea. I cannot remember. It's not a lot because it's on the CD, like it's on the Windows C, or XP CD along with all of your install files. So it's very limited, but it's not very big. But they do install a lot of additional so software with it. So it's, I want to say less than a gig, but I, I'm not positive. Yeah, eight gig, you'd be fine. Yeah, with that eight gig, you can get all this in installed. Um, Clonezilla, you can do network backups. Puppy, I put it in there because it's a very minimalistic version of Linux, so low resource environments. Derek's boot nuke is pretty self-explanatory. Um, it does that, it just, you boot it and your hard drive's gone. And Conboot, uh, <laughs> speaking of dares, what can you do? Give me like two minutes. Plug, gone, go back, you know. Uh, what are you doing? Oh, I've got it, it's set. You got, you're, um, hope you backed up. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, talk about ransomware. I backed up your files. Uh, so uh, Conboot is just this really cool thing that kind of circumvents slash modifies Windows to allow you to boot in to it. So that's, um, I'm not gonna, well I need to, actually, for my demo purposes, boot C, lib. It's, it's, VMware seems really slow through USB. Cause I don't think many people are trying to boot USB through 
This is like nobody ever does this. So it, it's, they don't really, there's not a big, you know, outcry. So I don't think they set up that much for it. Okay. Um, we're done with you for now. Where is my mouse? There we go. Live stuff. Scripts. Scripts are awesome. Um, and especially in these live environments, if you've never worked with them before, you, you know, you, they're live, they, you, can't, you can modify them while they're running, but you can't modify them and the updates and stuff. Um, they, you know, just they're, they're live, they're called live for a reason. So it's good to have scripts there to configure your environment. Um, time lost is point lost. So in the scenarios we kind of set up, uh, you are, might be accessing, say, if you're on an assessment and you're, you're trying to get to one of these computers, you're at somebody's office, they're out to lunch, you're not, you know, your assessment isn't going to last for three days of unrestricted access. You've got, you know, an hour to get your stuff done. So having a um, script that configures your environment, you know, does everything, automates your, the tasks that you want to you know, uh, do is great. So you can throw that on the flash drive before you start up. You can save it to the flash drive while you're doing stuff. It, it's, it's the way to go for live environments. Um, being for brain farts, yeah. Uh, so I mean, all of us here, you know, sometimes it's just easier to write a script to do something and save it because who wants to remember everything we have to remember? You have your repository of scripts. So it's very helpful that way. Just some simple examples, setting up a live environment um, for the configuration. Maybe you want to write a script to automatically download all the host systems, uh, Microsoft style documents or anything with passwords or something. And I'm not going to get into that much, but it's great to, to write these scripts in these live environments. Um, all right, moving on to the Katana toolkit. It's got um, a lot of stuff in there um, to run off of the, drive, of the Windows drive, or a USB drive in Windows. Um, you, should, you don't install resources on the host system. So it's great because you're not like, you know, installing whatever, like I got the box, all right, now let me put this package on there. You wait for install, you have to download it. This just runs live and not in VMware very quickly, but in your host system it, it runs much more quickly. Configurable, updatable, talked about that quite a bit. So we're on to demo two. Um, let's switch over to the, oh, no. It went, it went to sleep, so we'll wait for it to restore. So we're going to go into a Windows 7. We were going to go into a Windows 7 VM. Let's hope this works. It's, it's just very picky about passing through USB, so, oh. All right, let's come over. No, the other side. Need it to show up here. It's a live demo of VMware. Don't you understand? I had no phones in my pocket that time. I don't think. Okay. Excellent. The resolution's too big. Well, let's see if that gets fixed. Public user. So this is our public user account. Oh, fail. Yes, okay, it resized, that's awesome. And it, it's still mounted. Okay, cool, good. So uh, we open up the Katana drive on this. Oh yeah, it was up, great. That loaded quickly, because well, it takes forever. So here's the toolkit. Um, I tried to break everything down into like areas, so like you, office, um, uh, networking, forensics, uh, and this is a manual label. So if you install your own tools, you don't have to just update, use these. You can install other portable applications. It won't be named the same way, but see, so finding stuff, you just have to get used to, you know, what I labeled it under. But there's all kinds of stuff here. Um, what, when did I set up? Oh, I, I was gonna show Firefox, but it, through USB on this, it just takes forever. So we'll just pick a, a random one up. The, this is a little tool for um, looking at cookies, which in this, Scenario is probably pretty good. This uh, uh, just the cookies running in IE. Um, what else? We have a, there's a lot of stuff in here. Uh, I'll talk through them instead of showing all of them because they take a while to load. Um, there's a lot of forensics. There's a lot of forensic stuff in here. Uh, there's a lot of analytics um, on the. You know, there's also virus scanners that you can use. Um, backdoor stuff. 
uh, networking, a lot of, uh, you know, in map. Um, you have, but it has this like pigeon, you have, uh, let's see, uh, putty for, you know, communicating with other stuff. Uh, Firefox is on here, um, portable, um, open office. So a lot of the things is, you know, what do you trust in the host system? Well, don't trust any, you don't have to trust much, you can bring it here. Uh, you have Netcat, which is always fun. Everybody loves Netcat. Wireshark, uh, you have Kane, you have Metasploit, which took a little while, but I finally got it on there. Um, where's that? That's up at the top. Yeah. Oh, I have a laser pointer. Well, it's not my laser pointer, but I can actually point. Yeah, okay, so you have Metasploit, um, SSL scanners. You have a lot of just examining registry. The Windows registry is amazing because it stores everything you really ever need to exploit anything. So these are a lot of tools that like examine the registry and, and recover all your passwords. Everything you thought was a cool password in Windows is stored in the registry and it's like in plain text. So you know you learn that pretty quick and you start hitting this recovery area and it says, I want your uh, remote desktop key or, or, or password, I want your you know, mail password, your, your instant messaging password, all the passwords in Firefox, that's all the stuff in there that you can do. So I'm not going over exactly how to go through an attack, these are just, it's very broad scope what's in there. Um, a lot of analytics on the current running systems and other utilities. Uh, who's a Sigwin fan in here? Okay, so if you're if you if you're a Windows person and you're like ah you know Linux is scary, well you can install Sigwin, which is simple, and it runs Linux Unixy in your uh, on your um, Windows system. So it's a lot of fun. This is probably the most powerful thing, but it, it you have to configure it because it basically brings a lot of your Linux capable tools over. So this is something that when, if people are gonna get you know, serious about using this, I recommend you mess with the um, Sigwin and install a lot of your stuff on there because then you have a portable environment that runs a lot of the stuff that's running in like Backtrack. You can get, uh, there's a lot of stuff already, but a lot of things like, uh, like Metasploit runs on Sigwin here. There's several tools that run on Sigwin. So um, that's a really cool thing to get into. I even have like a key pass in there. So. You don't always have to use it for this sort of thing. You can have personal use reasons for it. So anyway, that's, um, that's the toolkit. Uh, just real quick, because people ask lots of questions that are in the help. So I decided to show in the, you know, stuff for the help. Um, whatever, that's good, good enough. Um, yeah, oh, crap, what is it? Uh, that's good enough there. So in this in this environment we're working in, um, it's a uh, oh no, oh I'll, I'll delete. That pissed it off. Damn you, Windows. There we go. No. This is. So in those environments, um, okay, we're good again. Uh, in those environments, you're looking at like restrictions, like uh, not being able to install. The reason the portable is great, because a lot of them, at least the basics you should do, is not allow people to uh, install software on your systems. I mean, that's kind of like the first thing you check off is don't let anybody install stuff. Well, this gets around it, because the installation mostly looks at the, the Windows executable that is used for installation. It restricts that. So you're like, oh crap, I can't install stuff. Well, if you don't need to install stuff and use that, you might be, might be good to run stuff off of the, the flash drive. So that's why another thing to circumvent um, a lot of stuff. And, uh, and other things like uh, access to, to certain executables. I mean, they can say, you know, you're only, you're, you can't access this other stuff on there, um, but you can run these portable ones because there's no rules for this random environment coming in there. So that's a good place to start. I don't know how time-wise I am. Am I like, am I having? 245. I have 15, okay, I'm gonna go quicker. Um, public computer, standard ways to get it, you know, going through Internet Explorer to get to that Katana thing. Um, Internet Explorer is great, because you can uh, type in the path. So this is, the end. like you type in D colon whatever, it brings up Explorer, and now you can access it. So again, we're looking from a, a public computer that probably has some sort of restrictions. Command line, if you can get up to the command line, um, I'll show you in a second, we'll talk about in a second how to do that. Go to the D drive, run it, life is good. 
Windows keys are awesome. Um, so a lot of times they'll restrict your environment so that you know there's no link to a lot of these things. So in Linux, you're like, oh, everything's there. You know, I just know how to do things. But in, in Windows, you have to have links to stuff, and you know, or you have to get to the command line. It's a big pain in the butt. So here's uh, the Windows keys to run things, um, to get Explorer uh, searching. These are good ones to get access to the, the underlying system for the purpose, in this case, of running the toolkit. Microsoft Help is so helpful. They let you run a command prompt from Microsoft Help. That's just, that's where to go, Microsoft. So um, if you go open the Microsoft Help, type in command prompt. It brings you to an article in there about the command prompt that's one of them says, opening command prompt, saying, this is how you open command prompt. Oh, would you like us to do it for you? You say, thank you, and bam, you've got the command prompt. So that's, that's a very, very, that's probably the most helpful thing in Microsoft Help I've ever seen. <laughs> Defeating the AV, I'm not going to go into this too much. Um, I found that when you open the toolkit menu, it accesses all of the binary files to read their image. So in that case, if your AV isn't set to automatically scan, but only look at you know, when you're loading things, it loads, accesses all of that stuff. So avoiding going through the interface, you can instead just go into the portable apps directory and traverse through there to get what you want. Everything is labeled pretty well. You can find the stuff you're looking for. You look at the help for more information on what's in there. But not loading it through that way can be one way to get through the AV. You can kill the AV. You know, Meterpreter is awesome at that. There's lots of other stuff out there. The thing I want to focus on is write blocking Katana. So still running from flash drive, but being able to write block, which is pretty awesome. Um, so why would we want to write block it? It kills the, uh, does, it stops the antivirus from, you know, deleting all of my awesome tools, and it stops viruses from installing on, you know, instead of turning me into a tool, so essentially. Um, <laughs> So, you know, we're like, oh, this is great. It's, you know, it's all in one. I can do whatever I want with it. I'll plug it in every machine in the network. Well, one of them's almost guaranteed to be owned. So then you become the person who's, you know, spreading that around. Because in case you don't know, there's been a couple of things with nuclear power plants that went over USB, um, a couple of, of malicious things. So you don't want to be that guy. You really just you don't want to be that guy. Um, and so, you know, coming in an environment with USB, I had to figure out how not to be that guy. So this is how, this is it. That's what I should have titled this how not to be that guy. Um, USB write blockers, you can purchase them for forensics purposes. There's a lot of kits out there for forensic stuff that's like, you know, government sanctioned ones and, you know, your lawyers would be happy with them because you paid a lot of money, which means they work. Uh, they're expensive, they're hundreds of dollars um, for the forensic, they're huge. You know, they, I, I imagine if you open it up, it's like, you know, a line going from here to there with some, something tiny in the middle and it's just a big block. But a lot of them, you know, they'll do stuff like tell you the data transfer rates and you just push a button. And they're fancy and it's cool and if you're, you know, if that's your thing, great, but they're, for, for us, us mortals, it's, it's very expensive being able to do it. You can create an ISO with Katana, so if you're gonna run your stuff from there, you can, you know, you can't, re unless it's a rewritable, you're, they're not messing with your ISO. Um, yeah, it's not, that's not the greatest. I would say that's like alpha. It's there, it exists, I really haven't messed with it too much, but. If you want to mess with it and tell me how it goes, that'd be great. Um, oh, yeah. So that actually, that warning label should come up with the previous one. But a lot of stuff is broken when you run it from an ISO because it's designed to modify itself. So, But anyway, the SD card stuff is the bomb. So instead of spending $300, $200, whatever, on a, a very fancy USB reader, you can buy a micro, well, I, I have a micro SD. I like that. But you can just get an SD card for 10 15 bucks, whatever, yeah. 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 So um, Nick was saying uh, that y you can modify. I guess the hardware modify the the USB um, device to prevent it from from writing, which is um, awesome and a little uh, and time consuming. So if you, which is it's the things we do because we can. You know, that's that's what happens. Uh, so that's a good option there. Um, to, to just modify the flash drive. But the problem is, you, undoing it, you have to like desolder or resolder or whatever, like, oh, let me put this back in. So if you want to uh, 
you know, put stuff back on there, you kind of have to do a lot of hardware work. So this is an easy option. Um, there's a switch that says lock. You push it, and it locks. Uh, it's a very, very good design that it, you know, it says it has an arrow that points the direction of the lock on this particular one. So, so well done. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy cool. Um, it, it locks. It's that. So uh, the, the, I have the S, this is the micro SD adapter. It, it, it's one of those things that it's probably in the standard that says this should work. But you know, people who implement flash drive readers, you know, don't, they don't read standards. They reverse engineer the, you know, the hardware of somebody else in China, and uh, just you know, oh, we'll sell it for 20 bucks cheaper. And who's going to complain about, oh, my flash drive reader doesn't do this because I paid five dollars for it? Like you're not, or I shipped it over from, you know, overseas. So they get by with it. So some of them support it, some of them don't. I I bought a couple in preparation for this talk and tested them. Only one didn't work. And I bought, like the one I'm using, well, let's see. My pocket. Too many things in my pocket. Bam, which is, I'm really kind of, okay, here's my little, um, the adapter that I've been using. This was like $5. And I bought, uh, when I got the flash, the micro SD, it came with this adapter and the, the uh, mini SD adapter. So that, you know, this whole, whole setup here, <clears throat> 30 bucks, 40 bucks, whatever, it's not crazy expensive. Um, so yeah, you lock that, remount it. The USB um, card reader says, oh, okay, it's locked now. And you know, it's, your operating system can't mess with it. There are also USB locks in the operating system, but I figured AV, I, I'm sorry, I assumed AV would, might be smart enough to disable that. I can't say that for sure. I haven't tested that on much. But there is, there's a registry key that says mount read only. But then it, that just becomes a little bit painful because if you set it like that, if you're doing stuff and you set it to read only, and then you leave, and then you know you get a call the next day, hey, I can't back up my stuff. You have to go, you, know, you have to embed this registry key. So this is a much easier, much cheaper, much quicker option. So yeah, it's that's it. That's done. Um, we don't need no stinking windows. That's that should have been. That's, a, that's another good title for a talk. Um, but that's exactly what I was referring to here. Uh, so if you want to run stuff in the toolkit but you don't want to run the native environment because it's infected. If you're doing forensics or, you know, for whatever reason, you don't want to run the host system because you're afraid of logging, you know, them monitoring stuff. How could you run the toolkit in another way? I'm all about just, you know, trying to figure out different ways around things. So BART PE, I mentioned it earlier, you can run most of the stuff in the Katana toolkit in here. It comes with a lot of stuff already. Um, you can also run it under Wine in Linux. How many people, most of the, Linux people have messed with Wine at some point. It's, it's awesome. It's like the, I don't want to say it's like the Sigwin and Wine are, they're similar. It, it helps you do the same stuff. So in Linux, because a lot of the live distributions are Linux, you know, you can run some of these tools in, um, in Wine. And I'm hoping, well, I don't have a lot of time. I was going to demo that, but it's not that fancy. You hit Wine and then the executable. There's a bunch of other flags you can do. And it'll, if it has the resources in Wine, it'll bring it up. And it works great because you can interact with the file system as though it's Windows. So like, you can access your, it doesn't create a virtual machine. You access the, the, the system that you're on. So you can access your files on your disk so you're not like completely segregating. So you can, you can do a lot of stuff uh, running it. Like I really love Windurstat. For anybody in here who does any sort of admin stuff, and or just wants to clean a system, Windurstat examines all of the files and then color codes them and categorizes them by their type. So like you're like, oh, why is this enormous? Oh, it's the, the shadow file in Windows 7 is just huge. Thank you, Microsoft. I don't mean to hark that much. I you know use Windows 7. This is 7, but it's you have a podium. Sometimes you have to vent. vent. Um, adding your own apps. So Windows, just install just in that directory. Linux, statically compile binaries. That's a cool thing to do. You can bring stuff with you. Statically compile basically means it's going to pull in all the resources it needs to run without you, um, without relying on the, the host system. So forensics, that's kind of cool. Or you, know, you want to bring Netcat with you without having to compile it. Basically, this is the compile free. What if they don't have GCC? It happens. You've got this stuff with you. Um, scripts, Python scripts, a lot of tools that we use are written in stuff like Python and Perl and Bash, so. Ah. Oh, my water. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah, this some crazy water, man. Um, OSX, I don't know. That's just, I don't, I don't use, as I mentioned before, I have the boat anchor. And that's what I've used on like the minimal testing I've done. Uh, it's got 10.4, I think. I'm pretty sure that's what it's running. So that's like, that's as far as I've gotten with it. I, I've been talking with some people online that have, have kind of been pushing me down that path and mentioning some stuff, but I, I just, I just don't mess with it. So I'd love to have more stuff for OSX in here. Yeah. Yes, that's a great question. I, I put that in my notes somewhere and I keep not looking down. He asked, does OSX boot from, with, with Katana? So it, it, most of these are compiled for Intel platforms. So if you're trying to get this on a Spark, you know, this, the hat, most of the stuff that's gonna work, unless you're running Windows on a Spark, which I have no idea if that's even doable. That'd be a good investment, Microsoft. Uh, <laughs> anyway, that was, um, OS X, that was my focus. Yes, you can run it on an Intel platform. Um, so yeah, most of those um, live systems, some of them are, yeah, will, will run because they're, um, they're, it's an Intel platform. So a lot of this, all that live stuff, That'll, that'll work on an Intel platform in which all the current Apple products, well, all the current like laptops and desktops are. So you can do all of that. The, the, it would be cool, you know, like I found Wine for, for Linux, for Windows, um, or for, for OS X, I don't know if there's some sort of emulator. I haven't seen Wine for OS X. I don't know what. Yeah. Okay, that's a good point, and I, I forgot to mention that. A lot of people run Windows on their Mac boxes. They just really want a very silver computer. That's pretty much their mindset. It's silver, look at this LCD. Oh, do you want to use their operating system? No. <laughs> I can't run, you know, I can't run this software on it, so whatever. I'm going to install Windows, but it's, it's shiny, and it's got that Apple logo, and I'm the man. Um, so, yeah, she was mentioning that you can uh, access a lot of the stuff from the Windows side in OS X on the host file system for, for um or from, sorry, in Windows on a Mac on the uh, uh, OS X side. So that's one thing to consider. Um, I think there are OS X portable stuff. It, but I don't think many people have looked into it, so I'm certainly not going to be the individual. Hmm? Oh. <laughs> Whoop. Is this door locked? I can just take it out. $100. Man, that's commitment. Um, Oh, what's left behind on the systems? Just, you know, me thinking ahead. The access logs, you know, from running, I'm saying it's portable, it's easy to use, you know, you're not messing with the resources. Well, of course you're interacting with the resources if you're running in this um, live environment, or not the live environment, on the, the toolkit side. So, you know, you have access logs. The USB history, uh, Nick was talking about that, um, that the, all the, like, profile information for USB device, um, very easy to fingerprint, uh, forensics, so, you know. That's, that's always there. AV logs, even if you have it right blocked, they're still gonna say, oh, I found this thing. That's the thing, it, right blocking it is great for the AV. It doesn't stop, it doesn't prevent AV from, from blocking stuff, it just prevents it from deleting it. It's very annoying. I actually, and, and I forgot that I'd done this from a, a while back, but I put the uh, zipped versions of a lot of tools in there because they kept getting deleted. But this was a year ago, left over from legacies because I kept being deleted, so I'd like go back, you know, get deleted and I'd go back and like re-extract everything. So that's why some of those, if you're looking around, you'll see some of them with like the zip files, the small ones, because the AVs weren't picking up the zip version. That's a very complex way to attack. I'll zip it and unzip it. Maybe you won't be able to find it. Um, external sources, you know, network logs, other system stuff, so you're not blocking with any of that. Future work. Um, I pretty much talked about all of these things. Um, Mobile device is the thing that will be cool. So that's why micro SD. Uh, how many people's phones use micro SD? So everybody else uses an iPhone, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah there we go. How many, how many people's iPhones use micro SD? All right. Um, so for most phones that are awesome, you, uh, you <laughs> I pissed off everybody in this talk. Uh, yeah, this is, this is going to be great if somebody watches it if somebody ever gets to see these videos. Uh, so I think it'd be really cool to, to, uh, to kind of uh, put these ideas into like a mobile phone environment where you're bringing around your stuff. You have to do forensics, so you know. You, forensics is one thing, but you know, just running your live stuff. A lot of them, 
you know, you root them and they'll run a lot of cool stuff. Well, what if you could bring that around with you? I don't know, it's not as easy, you know, this is great because I can go from any computer in my home and do all my stuff. You normally don't have multiple Android phones unless you're awesome. Uh, or you're deving it or you're hacking it or something. But um, this would be cool for, you know, various reasons. Uh, that's, you know, a future thing and we'll see if that ever happens. But yeah, um, that's it. That's it for me. Uh, do we have any questions real quick? Yes. Oh, is that the USB drives and like the? Yeah. Oh, just plug this into your computer. Oh, yeah, sure. No, no, you don't plug it in. Oh, it's nice. Like the holders. <laughs> so you, this, this is awesome. <laughs> it, it's a, it's a darn you, call them. Does it come in like, you know, like a oh, shotgun yeah. shell belt? Yeah, this is, that's awesome. It's SD card holder dot but they only sell it through Amazon. You have to get it from Amazon. Well, that defeats the whole purpose of putting it all on one flash drive. Thank you for completely all this work I've done is useless because you could just have <laughs> one thing in your back pocket. So you could have like, you got 80 gig worth of storage. So you could have, like, you could push, like, yeah, versions. Yeah, that's true. You could have your, like, forensic set up and you can have your pen testing set up. And, okay, yeah, that's, that, I'm, man, I'm feeling validated even more now. Yeah, okay. Um, okay. Good, good insight. Uh, anything else? Okay, I guess I'll turn it over. I'm probably like at time now, so. That's my info. Give, give Ronan a hand.